and then we're we're picking a uh, a winner. Um, a winner. Yeah. Who uh, pick me a winner? Pick you a winner. <laughs> You're out. I'm going to the man's. You want me? Hey, <laughs> so nice to meet you. Yeah, pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> He's going to be like a total uh, local. He's going to just use the uh, the tree right there. <laughs> <laughs> That's totally going in the video too. That's hilarious. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I should video going by. Don't pee on the tree. South Carolina for this to drive you for this interview seven <laughs> minutes. So how'd you get so fortunate to uh, end up in Delaware where the taxes are wonderful? Are you, are you born there? Or did you move there rather specifically because of the benefits of business? Uh, actually, I moved there for the opportunity for the business. I'm from Colorado myself, so oh, okay. yeah, I was uh, where Denver. I, I grew up in Lakewood, really? Green Mountain area. Cool. If you're familiar? Yeah, we uh, our business is now based in Thornton. Oh, and uh, and I live in Boulder. Okay, nice. So it is a cool, it's a cool zone. Yeah, it's. Uh, my wife keeps reminding me that, like you know, we were stupid idiots to <laughs> believe, even though it's been a very successful decision to make. Yeah. To to, to move, but uh, money is only a problem if you don't have it. Right. right? Yes. <laughs> How did you get involved in this business? My brother um, was married to the owner's one of the owner's daughters, right. and he kept. Requesting I come up and take an interview with uh, with Warren, and eventually I did. I was in a different industry. I was in a dot com, working in operational management in, in Denver, bicycling to work, enjoying life there. <laughs> Sounds uh, awful. Hate, hating car dealerships, <laughs> and, and, and and this guy's like, you know, hey, come work for my car dealership. I'm like, I don't like car dealers. So yeah. he's like, well, you're definitely the guy I want to talk to. <laughs> okay. Yeah, like perfect. That's awesome. Right. So that makes you I guess, yeah, you play hard to want, right? Yeah, that's great. <laughs> so. Sorry, I've been like consumed with No, that. no, this uh, is no, uh, true. Yeah, yeah coming, uh, yeah, hold it, rush hour in one of the biggest cities in the country. <laughs> what are you talking about? Yeah. <laughs> so, Jason, um, uh, thank you for being on the Diplomat Ride. We hope that we're giving you a, a, a good ride here to your destination. Um, will you do me a favor and just kind of tell us and tell our audience a little bit about your success in vehicle personalization? Specifically, as you've come in, as you were describing, you know, really from a different industry, different perspective, um, you know, tell us about your, your success with vehicle personalization. Sure. Um, you know, when I actually came into the industry, my brother was the one that was really big into accessorizing vehicles. He had, he had a background in, um, in hot rod, and I was always a big enthusiast, a big car enthusiast myself, always had modified vehicles pretty much the entire, my entire life. So the concept to me was pretty obvious of, you know, people love to accessorize their vehicles and they do so whether or not they do it at a dealership. And the, and the challenge then became, you know, I think there's, there's a, a de definite balance you have to find, right? At some point we were putting, we were the first company to put a super uh, turbocharger on an FRS, which was an epic failure, right? <laughs> well, because there was no mapping for the car, right? I mean, we, we ended right. up, you know, towing it to, you know, the first two car shows because we couldn't get it to, <laughs> to run for fear of blowing the motor up, right? right. Of, of right. running it too lean, which we ended up, yeah, you know, popping it anyway. So there's, you know, there's definite balance. We had a, you know, 500 horsepower, 12 inch lifted Tundra that we did. Uh, you know, with a supercharger, all TRD, you know, stuff. Yeah. So you know, the gamut can be really fun, uh, but there's, you know, there's pains that can be associated with that. So I think it's finding the sweet spot for it. Um, so our, you know, our process of how we kind of came to, into into really finding our groove with it was finding the right installers, installer, you know, setting up an installer program and making that, that a focus and then making the product itself not a giveaway product. It's a, it's a product that you that you sell to a customer that's not a, well, if you throw in the remote start, I'll buy the car kind of concept, right? Because right. otherwise you end up just not making any money on the deal and, and everybody, you know, it all unfolds. The other thing we did was, which was industry different, and we do a lot of things kind of differently, is break down the walls between profit centers, right? So if you, if you don't, if you, take, do, if you have every department put everything in as net profit, and then you split the gross at the end, 
by sales, service, and parts, you've got a winning combination because everybody's got a vested interest in its success, right? You don't just have the, the parts department yeah. loading up the cars or, you know, and then and then the service department getting hosed because they're having to unload, you know, parts that are, parts that are being installed, you know, if you're doing any pre-installation work. Um, and then really, you know, having, having a team that actually sells the product, right, and being able to provide quality products that, they can, that a customer can see and walk them through and be capable to walk them through the whole, the whole process with whatever it is that you're willing to sell, right? Don't sell superchargers on FRSs if you don't have someone that knows how to talk to talk to that person because you're just going to lose them, right? You know, lift, we do a lot of lift kits and we do a lot of cool rim and lift kit combinations, but we have passionate people that like to do that and, and actually will help the customer not make a bad decision on what's going to, you know, not work. Right or you know go beyond what's going to be what the capabilities of the vehicle are. Uh -huh. So let's go back for a second to the um, the breaking down of the walls for profitability because I know that that is uh, <clears throat> territorialism. <laughs> um, castle building is 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 rampant in a car dealership uh, it's in the normal formula. Yeah, it's terrible. Um, when did you make that decision? Has that always been the way you all have done business, or is that something that came about in the last six years? Pretty much. It, most of it was in place when I started, actually. Yeah, my um, the owner and my brother had, had kind of come up with that idea, uh, which actually is something that we've continued to adopt in more and more parts of the business ourselves, right? That's So really that was kind of a great starting point to break down the yeah. walls and, and make people realize that, hey, if we all work together, you know, it's, like, it's, it's kind of like... Um, used cars, right? I mean, everybody makes lots of money on used cars, but if everybody tries to make a disproportionate amount, then the whole thing doesn't work and nobody's happy. So right. yeah, 100%. It's, it's the same thing with the, uh, with the accessories and it's worked. It's become part of our culture. Yeah. That's amazing. Cause you know, so I spend a lot of time in the, all these d different dealerships and I mean, the parts department just absolutely loathes the service department <laughs> and the sales department hates them all. Right. And then, um, so you have parts and service and in sales and they all just fight each other and they're, they're constantly battling like okay i got this truck sold put the assist steps on the truck right oh no no right. you can't get it until like next thursday they're like no no i have a guy in the showroom he he's wants to buy here. the truck and drive it home right now right he's here doing the thing that we do for a living selling cars right and they're like oh no you know yeah. sorry man you know because he's got to beef with them and it's like you hear that all the time so the fact that you're able to pull this off I mean, if, if I was going to do anything other than, of course, sell really awesome car care products or amazing software, right? really amazing software. <laughs> Wait, you're getting into that business? I think that I, I want to get into, <laughs> or, <laughs> I, I wanna get into the relationship um, therapy, building um, sort of a psychology <laughs> deal that you you figured out because that's, right. that's what this whole industry, it really breaks so many dealerships in this industry. It just makes it... Yeah. Sucky, you know. Oh, it, makes, it makes the relationship so sucky that everyone. It's like this world. Same team, man. Yeah. Same team. Come on. And it's still. It's always work, right? It never. You know, you get different managers in. You get different employees in. They yeah. don't understand the philosophy and and even different products. You know, we'll pick up a different product and we'll have a different way that we sell it. You mm -hmm. know, like we're using a product right now that we're pre-installing and then we take it out if it doesn't sell. And, and you know, you just, you just have to have the hard ground rules and you know the teams will whine about it. Oh man, we're losing all this money. We're having to take the product out. Well, you know, you'll figure out how to become more efficient at it. Right, right. Watch <laughs> yeah. this, yeah. And, and you know, give me three months. And I, I, always, I always throw out to my team. I say, you know what? If I do a, if I'm, if I come up with a terrible idea and you guys do it a hundred percent, you do what I ask you to at a hundred percent and it's a terrible idea. I'll pay, I'll, I'll make you whole for all the money you lose. I will, I will put yeah. back in your paychecks all the money that you lost on my terrible idea. But if you don't put a hundred percent in, if you give me eighty percent or sixty percent of effort, right. if you if you're if you're sabotaging it, you get zero. We all lose, <laughs> right? And and it works. You know, I mean, I, 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 I probably twice in my career now I've had to you know I've had to step up and pay some people because you know not everything is you know yeah, we we're not all wizards with. Uh, <laughs> what? Why is it so? Why is it so hard to get a dealership to sustain this business to actually do it? When all the benefits are just tremendous, if you can get everybody working together, it's, you know, at the end of the day, it's 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 laziness to not do the lifting that you need to do. Yeah. You, you know, you said that it's you know, it's so, why is it you know why should it be so hard for us to? It, it's a complicated thing to get sales, service, and parts to work together. That's what they. I mean, that's what the business is founded on. So by definition, that's like that's where I kind of always scratch my head and go, okay, we are a business that supplies parts. 
for technicians to install, right. and, and we have a sales force to sell. That you sold. Yeah. Right. So to me, why that, is it so hard? All, all these, you know, but yeah. the, you know, the sales pe the sales people are terrified of of upselling a product, right? Because once they got the sale, they don't want it to unwind because, you know, you, you don't want the you know the, the fear is, I sold the car. God forbid I try to sell a bed liner for that truck, uh, you know, or or a, or a you know window tint or whatever the case may be, a remote start because you know I, I already got the customer to say yes, and 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 you know I already asked for every last dollar, so you know they're they're fearful of it, and so there's there's um, if they haven't been proven it, that it can work, right? Everybody's skeptical and they don't believe, so that's that you know that's one huge barrier to success right there. Yeah. Um, you know, parts departments, I found out when I got into this industry, uh, they, they actually aren't, they don't really care about providing a valuable service to the dealerships themselves or the customers, right? They, you know, why put a pair of, you know, OEM factory pads on a 250,000 mile car that's coming in for service, right? You, we can do better than that. We can get right. better value for us. We may make higher profits, but that's, you know, it's it's not the easy way to do it it's it actually takes extra work right. you actually have to build relationships with you know we've got a guy that goes to ces or or sema every single year and he sources the best remote start parts for the for the new models of vehicles that are coming out to make sure that we're getting the best value and you know this guy's he's a passionate installer so he's willing to take the time if i asked my parts department to do that we would be we would be still installing i don't know you know bricks that you throw at cars to start them because <laughs> 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 you know, they just wouldn't care to make the change right they would say well the factory doesn't sell that part so we, we can't install it um you you made another awesome comment about simply paying for the ideas that fail and that reinforces um a mentality that's clear by what you're talking about, which is, um, you know, and this is kind of tough for some dealer principals and managers to hear, but you run the place. <laughs> yes. Uh, your name is on it. You run the place. You tell people how you are going to do business. And so often we find that it's like, yeah, my salespeople just, they, they just don't do it. Excuse me? <laughs> who who, who yeah. made the decision around here? Right. Right. right? So, do you do you find yourself in a position where sometimes it's like, yeah, you're just gonna do what I tell you to do, and yeah, we're we're well, I'll pay you for the ideas, but at the end of the day, they know that you're backing it up with with a little bit of, you know, this is this is this is how we're gonna operate. Right. You have to pick your battles in in any business, and you know, I think some people see this. You know, it's a small. With with margin compression, like it's easier for a lot of dealers to complain about. Oh, I've got no front end gross. All the, you know, there's no margin in the business anymore. You got to make it up on back end. Um, so you you know, at some point you got to draw the line of saying you got to quit saying, well, I'm you know, I'm just making less money, and you got to figure out, okay, well, what am I going to do to make more money? And it's right. you know, and it's going to be incremental. And if you get two hundred dollars a car, three hundred dollars a car more, that's that's all money that you just made back up that you know that you lost through margin compression or through having to give the deals away in order to make these transactions. And you have to find champions that are going to that are going to support it because as a, as a dealer, you know, unless you're a single point dealer and you're and you're in the store every day and you can you can kind of keep your thumb on the on the team to, to force change, you want to find a champion or two champions in your store. People that are, you know, it's it's easy to find. You know, if you talk to your team, look, go out to the parking lot. Look at the guy that's got the car that's all done up already. Yeah. And and that you know if that's a, if you see a salesperson coming in in a lowered car with rims, that's <laughs> yeah. my man. Yeah, exactly. That's your right there. Man. He understands accessories. That, that, exactly. you know, you want to go to SEMA next year? Yeah, yeah well, and you, yeah. you can even start off small. You know, you may give that guy the, give that guy the extra bonus yeah. in the spiffs for selling some accessories, and get him to you know do the process, and then other people will see the success. And right, you make a big deal out of it. Right, show show it on the board. Right, show this guy. You know, hand him a couple hundred bucks. You know, at the end of every month, in front of everybody else for being the number one achiever for for accessory volume. Mm -hmm. Right, make make him passionate about it there again everybody's fearful of their of th this industry is don't ch you know is don't change when i got when i came in the business it was you know I, it was a you would get practically fired if you said that's the way we've always done it because if that's if that's your answer if that's your best reason for why you're doing it then then there's a problem right yeah, so awesome. question do you do you guys do any like the dealer added uh, protection programs like um you know, the sealants, the interior protection. Oh, of course. You guys, yeah, you, get, you get a pretty strong sell-through on that, or do you uh, do you put it on all cars and then collect for whoever's going to pay for it? Or how do you guys, how do you find that to be successful? So, paint, the paint and fab portion of it, if your penetration is usually about 20% or better, 
the men, whoever you're working with will give you the product to put on all the cars. Right. Because it's, at the end of the day, it, it, it may be beneficial to the paint. It may be beneficial to the fabric that, that you're putting, you know, if it's a fabric seats on the car. Mm -hmm. But it's really an insurance product at the end of the day. That's exactly right, yeah. And, and if you don't put it on, but the other thing is, like, I've had, you know, if they get shoddy about it, it can look terrible, too. Like, I, you know, you take a leather car like this yeah. with beautiful black leather seats in the back, and you got the guy that's just doing the wipe to here, and you see these swirl marks from where they're wiping it, and it totally. stays like that, and you're like, dude. Oh, well right? So you have to be cognizant of, of, of how, you know, doing a quality job every time as well. So you, you mentioned that you were uh, kind of a car nut anyway before, so what's your, what other, obviously, you're, you're not, you didn't just get into it. Yes, yes, yes. Do it, do it, do it, do it, do it, go, go, go. There you go. Make it happen. I'm getting indoctrinated. I'm telling you, go not hard. Bad. Not Just bad for a go southern. hard. <laughs> um, I'm going to get out. I'm getting out with him. I'm going to go in and find the nearest man's room. Gotcha. Nice. Because uh, I've been sitting around driving in traffic for too long with you, apparently. <laughs> so what else uh, What else have you uh, yeah, been what's into? Your, what's your, what was your first car? My very first car was... Uh, pickup truck was a actually was a, a Chevy 1970 long bed pickup truck no which I had a blown motor that my dad gave me yeah. and we spent the summer rebuilding the motor I worked for free for my dad as pizzeria for a whole summer and we bought all the he bought all the parts then so I got the motor then I went out and bought a rolling X race car that was a 1968 Camaro for like a thousand bucks with no motor transmission huh. uh, and I took the motor it was a four bolt main I pulled it out of that in my in my front yard and threw that motor and tranny into the into the race car Camaro which oh, I don't know how my parents let me go with that one because it was a full cage car <laughs> that you know I don't even know how I got how I got a street legal but no, uh, no, but no, I got no. a, I, you know, I pulled that off and and uh, it's kind of fun because I had 488 rear end gears which was kind of a oh, ridiculous car because yeah it, it, zero to 100 no problem but you know, 110 you were done it was you know 9,000 RPM yeah yeah you couldn't yeah. couldn't drive it on the highway it was, it was <laughs> just stupid that's cool. Um, well, we are approaching, I think it's on this next block yep. past this light. Yep. Um, and, uh, Perfect. Thank you for your business. Really um, appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you for being a part of this. This was great. Um, we're going to end four different windows. You know, you'll be in the A winner. Um, a winner. Yeah. Who? Dude, uh, pick me a winner. Pick you a winner. <laughs> you're out. I'm going to the man's. You want me? Hey, <laughs> so nice to meet you. Yeah, pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> He's going to be like a total uh, local. He's going to just use the uh, the tree right there. <laughs> <laughs> That's totally going in the video too. That's hilarious. Oh my gosh. That's <laughs> a video going by. Don't pee on the tree. I hope you've enjoyed the hashtag Diplomat Ride interview series. I know Adam and I had a blast connecting with our dealers and talking about vehicle personalization. A giant thank you to our participants, Rick Reichert, Paul Allred, Jason Walsh, and John Peter Savage. A ginormous thank you to Adam and his team at Adam's Polishes for supporting us on this crazy journey. If you want more in-depth interviews about vehicle personalization, check out our new podcast at Next Up Accessories. It can be found here on YouTube or on any of the podcast channels that you listen to. All right, Adam, it's time for the big reveal. Take it away. Rick Reichardt of Reichardt Automotive. Well, thank you to David Stringer of Insignia Group. Thanks for having me along. This has been really fun. I want to thank all the participants that came along with the Diplomat Challenge. And I also want to say congratulations to Rick Reichardt and thank you for playing.